Uh, it's never a dull moment in Ukraine's elections. Um, and that's certainly the case um, as we approach it in the final few weeks before the last day of March, uh, just two days after the big day in Britain, Brexit. Um, and then three, three weeks after that, uh, which will be on um, uh, Easter as per the new calendar, uh, there will be the second round of the presidential elections. And there's, uh, there's only been two occasions when there hasn't been a, a second round, and that was in 1991 when Krauchuk won in the first round and in 2014 when Poroshenko won in the first round. That's unlikely in this occasion. What has changed in the, the last uh, month or so is that um, there was a tendency, and, and I think the most important thing isn't to focus on the numbers, it's to focus on the overall tendencies uh, month by month um, where things are going and to compare a range of different opinion polls. There's about three, four, maybe five um, reputable sociological agencies in Ukraine, Razumkov Center, Democratic, Democratic Initiatives, Ratings, um, Sotsis, and a couple of, maybe one more. And they all say the same thing, that since about December, uh, Timoshenko's um, overall tendency has been to drop um, and to third place. Um, Poroshenko's has been to rise. And the big new boy uh, on the block, as it were, is Zelensky, who's, who's come into first place. My own uh, feeling is that we have to take, of course, opinion polls into account, but at the same time, they are not gospel. Um, because, for example, in the case of Zelensky, um, I think most of his voters um, um, are young people. They don't tend to come out in elections. By the way, one of the reasons why Brexit um, was um, something that, that won a majority was because those hipster types who were pro-European didn't bother to come and vote, whereas white working class angry men did come and vote. Um, so there you are. And that's the problem that Zelensky will have. Another problem that he has is that um, it's one thing to protest um, in an opinion poll, and it's another thing to come out and vote on, on election day, particularly because Zelensky um, isn't just anybody. I mean, he's very easy to parody as a clown, as a comedian, um, and, um, and therefore it's very easy to ask, do you really want a clown or, or comedian to be your commander-in-chief when you're at war with Russia? Um, and, and that is a major, major point in these elections that you're not just voting for a president, you're voting for a comedian. So therefore, it's not the same as in Italy, where everybody compares it to, where, where an Italian comedian formed the five-star populist movement. Um, Italy is not at war with anybody. Ukraine is. Uh, and in a recent opinion poll by Democratic Initiatives found that 72% of Ukrainians believe their country is at war with Russia. 72%. That's a huge number. Uh, including uh, uh, between 50 and 60 percent in eastern and southern Ukraine. So the, the, the importance of who will be commander-in-chief is as important for voters in this election as it is who will be the next president. And that will in inevitably impact upon whether, for example, um, they will vote for Zelensky and for Timoshenko. It won't really impact upon Poroshenko because he's already campaigning on a platform of he's the one who built uh, the Ukrainian army. So he's already got that you know, under his belt and he can point to um, success stories on that. But certainly um, the question of do we want to no longer have Poroshenko as commander in chief and we'll happy to go with Zelensky, Timoshenko, Kurtsenko um, is going to be a, a question. So therefore, I don't think Zelensky's opinion poll ratings will necessarily translate into a presidential victory or even first place in the um, first round. Um, a, a new poll 
I just saw, for example, and this is, a, I think this is a question that is more important in some ways, not who you will vote for. Um, the question asked, who do you think will win the elections? And this is the second time I've seen this where uh, Poroshenko again comes first. People think he'll come first in elections, Tymoshenko second, and Zelensky third. So this is, again, I think, more a reflection of reality than opinion polls as such. Um, Tymoshenko um, also, um, we have to understand, and this has always been the case with her, is that opinion polls underrate her, um, uh, her popularity. And that's because she has a lot of support in, in villages, um, in, uh, amongst lower socioeconomic groups, in small towns, and often these groups of people do not get asked anything in opinion polls. And therefore, it's always the case that people are surprised that she gets more than the opinion polls show. This is not unusual. Um, in the Brexit referendum, two million people um, who would, weren't supposed to exist came out to vote um, who don't usually come out to vote. And those were the people who tipped the balance in favor of Brexit against remaining in the EU. And they were tapped into very cleverly by the Remain, uh, sorry, by the Leave Brexit campaign. Um, and, and many of those kind of typical voters are Timoshenko. So we have to be cautious about opinion polls. They do give us trends, but they don't give us the final uh, result. We do at the moment seem to have a contest between three people, Zelensky, Timoshenko and Poroshenko. Um, and um, with uh, third place, possibly, sorry, with fourth place, most likely to be Anatoly Gritsenko, former defense minister. He got a bit of a boost a week ago when the mayor of Lviv, Andrei Sadovey, dropped out of the race and said he would support Gritsenko. I don't think that will give him a massive boost. I mean, he's, I don't think he's got a chance to get into the second round um, for all sorts of reasons. He has zero charisma. Um, he's, you know, he's not exactly a new face. This is his third attempt. Um, he doesn't really uh, do well in TV interviews. Um, and he has hanging over him the scandal, oh, the corruption scandal of when he was defense minister after the Orange Revolution. And by the way, he continued to be defense minister under Prime Minister Yanukovych, um, where the Ukrainian army was heavily um, depleted in its resources and the money from the sale of these resources, nobody knows where it went. So that's still hanging over him to this day, that, that scandal. So I don't think he'll do better than, say, fourth place. That means that the first four places are kind of taken by people, depending on how it will match out. Um, and therefore, um, there'll be no pro-Russian candidate until at least fifth place. Um, I think that's the best that he, he can do, and that's only Yuri Boyko. The other two pro-Russian candidates, Vilkul and Murayev, are going to be way, way down, down the list. Um, what's interesting about the pro-Russian camp is that it's so weak for because it's lost a lot of its voters who are in Russian occupied territories, the party of regions is no longer around and that was certainly a strong political machine. Um, and of course Ukrainian identity has changed. The very fact that 72% of Ukrainians um, believe they're at war with Russia has an impact not only in the west but also in the east of the country. Views which were critical of Russia which were up until 2014 only really around in Western Ukraine and now spread to the entire country. So Boyko is only in first place in three of Ukraine's uh, eight oblasts in Eastern and Southern Ukraine. Um, and those three of the eight are Kharkiv, Donetsk and Luhansk. So those are not enough to give him, shall we say, second or third place. That's why he's in fifth place. And also, um, you know, his views on, on um, doing a peace deal with Russia are not very popular, even with opinion polls, um, the, the idea that somehow you can negotiate something. Well, you can only go negotiate something with Putin if you're willing to basically put up your hands in the air and surrender. 
because that's Putin's understanding of compromise. And also Putin is refusing to talk about anything to do with the Crimea. So he's only talking about a peace agreement with the Donbass, not with the Crimea. So I don't think that that's going to be a very popular move. What is interesting is that now we have access to election programs. Um, and the election programs are fascinating, not only because of what they say, but because of what they leave out. The most fascinating aspect of, 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 of this is, and again, I'm surprised nobody's picked up on this, is that um, of the 44 candidates who are registered in this election, not a single one, including Boyko, Murayev, and Vilkul, three from the former party of regions, not a single one of the 44 candidates uh, supports integration into Putin's Eurasia. Um, until 2014, this was called the CIS Customs Union. Since 2015, it's called the Eurasian Economic Union. Not a single candidate, not a single one supports that, or at least puts it in his program. Um, yes, the pro-Russian candidates support, um, they don't support EU and NATO membership, they support um, a so-called non-bloc or neutrality status. Ukraine had that under Yanukovych from 2010 to 2014. Um, the very fact it's in there, it, it doesn't really mean much because it's a very discredited stance. Um, Ukraine had a neutral or non-bloc status in early 2014, and that did not stop Russia annexing the Crimea and invading eastern Ukraine. So there, there you are. Neutrality didn't really help Ukraine very much then. Um, so that's a very easy argument, and I've used that myself on Ukrainian television in combating Vilkul and Nestor Shufrich on their claims for supporting non-bloc status, and they don't really have a counter-argument. You know, it failed in 2014, so why should we continue to want it now? Um, but again, what's fascinating is how so few of Ukraine's 44 candidates have bothered to include EU and NATO membership in their programs. Um, 11 of the 44 have included EU and NATO membership, but those of those 11, most of them are names that none of us know. So they're not important names and they, don't, they won't get many votes. But of the big names that we know, you people are a bit surprised that Gritsenko has nothing. He doesn't even mention EU or NATO at all in his program. And that's surprising because Sadove did, and he's dropped out and now supports Gritsenko. And I was just at an event, um, a, a Ukrainian kind of conference in Brussels a week ago, where representatives from these candidates were on a panel. And the representative for Gritsenko was um, Zelishchuk, she's a member of parliament from the Poroshenko bloc. She just left it a few days ago um, because she's one of those dissidents like Sergei Leshenko. Um, and she's the representative or foreign policy representative of Gritsenko. So I put that to her, you know, how come Gritsenko forgot about EU and NATO membership? Timoshenko also. Um, this is very, very odd that. Um, your party, Batkivshina, Fatherland Party, is a member of the EPP, the European People's Party, which is the center-right political group in the European Parliament. And Ukraine has an association agreement and a visa-free regime with the EU. Nevertheless, in Timoshenko's election program, the EU is never mentioned once. Um, NATO is mentioned in one line, pathetically. It's mentioned where we will continue to support military cooperation with NATO. That is no big deal. Ukraine's been doing military cooperation with NATO since the 1990s. Um, and, and, and it's speeded up since 2014. So that's nothing sort of unusual and nothing um, interesting to put in your election program. But there's no mention of her supporting EU or NATO membership in her election program. So. This is really surprising for another reason. So this gives Poroshenko fantastic arguments that he can use in any election debates 
that, or in any election advertising, that I'm the only candidate that actually goes out of my way, and he has about two paragraphs in his election program, where he categorically states, I support Ukraine's continued drive to join the EU and to join NATO. He says that in, if he's re-elected in 2023, he will apply for EU membership for Ukraine, and he will uh, strive to get Ukraine inside a membership action plan, a map, which is the preparation stage before you join NATO. And he's the only one. I'm surprised that people like Timoshenko Gretsenko gave Poroshenko so much ammunition that he can use in these elections. It's also surprising because opinion polls in Ukraine show that there's been a massive change since 2014. Uh, support for Eurasian integration has collapsed. Um, it's gone down from about 35% until 2013 to about 10% today. Um, that's maybe why it's not including any of these programs. Um, but NATO membership, um, if it was put in a referendum, would get about 60, 65, sometimes 70% support, and the same with the EU. So you wouldn't lose anything in terms of uh, voters' support if you put it in your program. So therefore, it's baffling. The only thing I can think of why people like Guritsenko and Timoshenko didn't include it in their programs is that they're on a they're standing on a kind of a populist platform, and by populism here I mean where they say that everything to do with Poroshenko is horrible, as opposed to saying, well, I think he's done this terribly, but this has been done okay, this has been done well, you know, a kind of a balance sheet of Poroshenko's presidency. Instead, these candidates stand on the platform of everything he's done is bad. Now, th this is just simply not the way we do things in elections. I mean, I don't think political parties going to elections are saying, you know, everything previously was done badly. Now, Donald Trump is like that. He's a populist. For him, anything that Obama did was terrible. For example, the Iran, Iran nuclear weapons agreement, which I'm sure Trump never read. But, but, that, but that approach is simply pure populism. It's not really approach which it's to do with Ukrainian national interests, which is that the next five years are going to be important for Ukraine to do its finalization of breaking away from the Ruski Mir, the Russian world, and joining Europe. Um, and therefore, you should be putting that in the, inside your election programs. So um, that is a surprising aspect of Ukraine. In terms of domestic policies, um, there isn't much difference between them. These programs are pretty dull and boring. They, they promise a lot. There's nothing much concrete there. They're all promising that if, if I'm elected, I will end the war. Nobody has any concrete details of how that will happen um, because the only person that can end the war is the person who started it, Vladimir Putin. Um, and if you are willing to, to kind of get on your knees and do a deal with him, as Zelensky said he would, then you're basically going to put your hands up in the air and say, I surrender, Ukraine. And if you tried that today in Ukraine, you wouldn't last president for a long time. There, is enough, there are enough um, patriots and veterans around to prevent any kind of, um, shall we say, treasonous act on the ranks of what uh, Viktor Yanukovych did in spring of 2014. So, so to sum up, we have three, three people battling away for um, first and second place, Timoshenko, Zelensky, Poroshenko. Um, I think Z Zelensky is um, a kind of a fake news candidate in some ways. He's a protest guy. I somehow I doubt that he will um, do as well as his poll ratings suggest. Um, they, it would, the, the most shocking probably turnout for round two would be um, Zelensky versus Timoshenko, um, a um, very prominent um, anti-corruption campaigner said on the BBC a few days ago that if that were to happen, if there was going to be a second round between Zelensky and Timoshenko, this would be terrible because it would be a, a choice given to Ukrainian voters of choosing between Kolomoisky number one and Kolomoisky number two. Um, so um, 
that um, that that would be, I think, something um, very surprising and very stunning for Ukraine. Um, I would be I'm, I would be fascinated to watch a debate between either Zelensky and Poroshenko or um, Timoshenko and Poroshenko. I think any of those debates, if they were going to happen, would be absolutely ama amazing to watch. I think third place um, is very likely to be um, probably um, one of those three. Fourth place, Gritsenko, fifth place, Boyko. So I think the, I think the first five um, kind of places are kind of already um, prejudged. I don't think that can change now before March 31st. Um, what we do have is a, um, a election where the pro-Russian vector is extremely weak. No candidates have, um, are, are, are brave enough to include um, support for Eurasian integration in their programs. No pro-Russian candidate will get into the second round. But Zelensky here is a potential uh, dark horse. Because going back to foreign policy issues, he has a very, I mean, he's totally um, a, uh, unqualified for, for this field. Um, and that's obvious from the answers he gives to questions. But in his election program, Zelensky's election program, he has a very bizarre statement where he says he will support um, a referendum on deciding whether Ukraine will join NATO or other security formations. Now, this is, it seems as though this is maybe written neutrally, but that's not the case, because the only other security formation that exists besides NATO is the Russian-led Tashkent Treaty, so-called CIS Collective Security Organization. So, it, so is Zelensky proposing we choose between both of these bodies? If he is, then he's gone a step towards the pro-Russian camp even more than even Yanukovych, who, who he never did that. Um, no Ukrainian president since 1991 has supported Ukraine's integration into, into Russian-led security formations, and none of them. So Zelensky here is, um, is very foolish to include that in his election program, and that will rebound against him um, in, in the election campaign. Um, so it's going to be, I think, a, a fascinating one. Um, surprising, it's not surprising that uh, scandals have already begun appearing. I'm very suspicious of the timing of these corruption scandals. You know, journalists say, oh, we've, we've worked on these for a long time and we just had to release them now, just before, of course, election day. Uh, there's a scandal surrounding um, corruption in the military that may drag in Poroshenko, maybe not. Um, it's, it's already been dealt with, but certainly going to maybe hang over his head, particularly because he's promoted himself as the person who has built the Ukrainian army. Um, there's a scandal surrounding Timoshenko um, about uh, fake donations to her party. Um, Ukrainian journalists um, went and asked many, many different people um, did they really make donations to Timoshenko's uh, political party, but Kipshina? And they all said no. So investigators from the authorities are inquiring, where did all this money come from? It's very suspicious. Um, basically, people's names were used as fake dona donors to Timoshenko's party. And we're talking about a huge amount of money here. Um, and it's obviously Ill illegal and corrupt to do that. And then Zelensky has a corruption scandal because he's been, um, his uh, TV show and his production company on One Plus One Channel has been taking money from the uh, Russian government since 2017. And he won an award there. And he's been, he has business interests inside Russia, which were which are not closed down after 2014. So there we are. Welcome to Ukraine. First three candidates are Zelensky, Timoshenko, and Poroshenko, and they all have a uh, scandals blowing up over the over their heads, uh, so nothing unusual there in Ukraine. Um, let's hope this 
uh, will continue to be a peaceful election. Russians are trying to do various things to try and undermine it. They don't want to see a democratic and free Ukraine integrate into Europe. And the security service are um, being very adept at trying to stop anything that the Russians are doing, including cyber warfare. Um, on that note, um, I'll um, finish. Um, and of course, um, I will try to find a chocolate hat in the meantime, in case I have to eat my hat, um, and because I'm wrong in terms of my predictions. Thank you. Thank you.